Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you had the chance to to rest last night after the nice dinner we had in Brussels and everything. Um, I'm I'm welcoming you. To, as you know, today we're, I'm very happy to say that this is the third year that we're going to cover the AL amyloidosis topic here in the in the myeloma patients Europe. AGM, so we have a, a full morning. First of all, we have a lecture, and it's my pleasure to, to welcome Professor Natalie Mulliman. She is, works at the hematology uh, department at the Institut Jules Bourdet uh, in, in Brussels here, and, uh, and she's also the president of the Belgian uh, Society of Hematology. And uh, in this first uh, session, she's going to explain us more about, about what is AL amyloidosis, how it is diagnosed, how is it treated, which I think is a gr great challenge to condense all this information, but we're very happy to, to have you with us. So, Professor Milleman, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for the kind invitation and the introduction. So, I think that me, my task today is very complicated because amyloidosis, it's not a simple disease to understand. It's not a simple disease to diagnose and to treat. So, I will try to be as uh, clear as much as I can, but don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have any question. First of all, I will try to give a definition and to explain what is amyloidosis. I will then try to explain the link with the multiple myeloma and um, how to diagnose this and how to treat uh, this disease. Decrease the... Yes. So, hello. <laughs> you know, just starting, just give the introduction and nothing else. So, if you want to give a definition of amyloidosis, we have to first say that it's not a disease, but it's a group of different diseases, and there is different kind of amyloidosis. I will give a brief explanation on that, but we will focus on AL amyloidosis, the amyloidosis uh, which has a link with um, multiple myeloma. So, um, it's a group of disease and it's a rare disease. And probably not so rare of that, I think that we uh, underdiagnose this uh, disease. And the disease is due to the deposition of extracellular amyloid. So, what is amyloid? Amyloid, amyloid it's an um, insoluble protein, it's a fibril protein. Um, that will uh, assemble with um, a special configuration. We call it um, beta sheet, cross beta sheet conformation. I will give you a picture later. And so um, you have uh, in the cells the production of small protein. Um, here you have normal protein, and here you have some. Um, protein that uh, can give uh, fibro uh, amyloid uh, um, uh, protein. And so um, this uh, abnormal protein will have an abnormal configuration and uh, will uh, have a misfolded um, configuration that will give a high propensity to self-aggregate. And after the misfolded of those small protein, they will um, aggregate in with other uh, small uh, component in amyloid uh, fibril. And those protein uh, will um, go in the organ and give the organ dysfunction. And so in those amyloid fibril, you have about 95% of those fibrillar protein, but also 5% of other protein. And it's important because uh, new treatment uh, who are coming, uh, we hope they are coming in uh, next year, will also target those uh, glyc uh, uh, glycoprotein. And so um, the 
the dysfunction of the organ will come from the deposition of this uh, abnormal protein, but uh, also of the coming from the direct toxicity of uh, those precursor of this uh, uh, amyloid uh, fibril. And so um, the, um, those small cells can induce the death of the cellule uh, by a mechanism that we call apoptosis. So this is another way uh, to uh, explain it. So you have the naive protein, then the misfolded protein uh, that will aggregate in a small um, small component of uh, oligomer and then in protofibril and then the fibril uh, that will link with other glycoprotein and uh, give this uh, specific uh, configuration of the amyloid fibril that will um, uh, go in the uh, organ. And so uh, amyloidosis uh, can give a lot of organ dysfunction. Um, the fibril uh, can be de could be a deposit on the liver, on the heart, on the spleen, on the uh, liver, uh, liver, on the brain, on the kidney, and uh, we will see that uh, in AL amyloidosis, the two uh, organs that are more frequently um, um, attained by this disease are the heart and the kidney. So as I told you, um, amyloidosis is a group of disease and there is many kinds of uh, amyloidosis. Uh, we have uh, identified more than 30 different precursor protein and um, we can have different subgroup of uh, amyloidosis. So amyloidosis can come from an aging process and so a normal protein that could have an anthracic propensity uh, to have a pathologic conformation, uh, conformation. that's the case of the senile, uh, senile systemic amyloidosis. You can also have an abnormal prolonged exposition to normal protein that could also cause this amyloidosis. And it's the case uh, with uh, arthritis, chronic arthritis. Uh, we call it uh, AA amyloidosis. It's patient with chronic inflammation and the protein from the inflammation could also give this uh, fibril of amyloidosis. Patient in dialysis could also have uh, accumulation of beta-2 uh, microglobulin, uh, but it's becomes more rare with the new technique of dialysis. You, you can have also um, a remodeling of a pre pro normal protein precursor, that's the case also of Alzheimer's disease. And the last uh, subgroup, it's the presence of abnormal protein. And we know that there is a uh, second most frequent is the uh, mutation in a t what we call transtyretin protein. Uh, and also in this subgroup, we have the um, immunoglobulin light change uh, called AL uh, amyloidosis. And today we will uh, talk about this AL amyloidosis and I will uh, explain you uh, just after what's the link with the multiple myeloma. So uh, amyloidosis is a very uh, complex disease with very different process um, that could give uh, this, uh, those complications uh, with organ dysfunction. And you can see on this slide, it's confirmed that it's a rare disease. It's about nine cases per um, um, one million of persons. You can see also that uh, the, the incidence is stable for the AL amyloidosis, so coming from the monoclonal protein. The um, incidence of uh, amyloidosis coming, coming from the inflammation is decreasing because we have no more uh, powerful treatment for those kinds uh, of disease, polyarthritis uh, and other one. And um, the senil amyloidosis and the transtyretin amyloidosis, mainly cardiac amyloidosis, 
the incidence is, is, in, is increasing probably because we have more uh, efficacy uh, tool for the diagnosis. And so uh, you can see that um, AL amyloidosis, uh, so light chain amyloidosis, is the more frequent amyloidosis, at least in Europe and in, in other um, continent also. So what is AL amyloidosis? I think that you all have some kind of link with multiple myeloma. You probably all know that uh, the plasma cell are producing uh, antibody. In those antibody, you have uh, what we call heavy chains, such as IgG, IgA, IgD, um, IgM. Uh, uh, but you have also the production of uh, light chains. That's the light chains uh, that could be linked to the EV change, uh, EV change or the uh, uh, circulating in the blood. And there is two kinds of light chains, the kappa uh, light chains and the lambda light chains. You probably um, also know that normally we are secreting, those plasma cells are secreting a lot of different antibody, what we call polyclonal antibody, and sometimes you can have a mutation uh, that will give uh, monoclonal plasma cells, a clone with all the same uh, plasma cells that uh, will give a monoclonal protein, what we call um, a monoclonal peak on the electrophoresis. And so that's the link between amyloidosis and multiple myeloma. In fact, uh, multiple myeloma are coming from the development, the development of those plasma cell, monoclonal plasma cell clone, and amyloidosis is coming also for the development of a uh, dose clone. So amyloidose, uh, the um, amyloid fibril uh, for the AL amyloidosis is coming from the secretion of abnormal light chain uh, from those uh, clone of, of uh, plasma cell. So as for the multiple myeloma, the uh, median age of diagnosis is between 60 years old and 70 years old. And um, so the link is the expansion of the monoclonal plasma cells. But we also know that about 10 or 50 percent of the patient with multiple myeloma could have at the diagnosis or during the evolution of the disease an uh, AL amyloidosis. So AL amyloidosis uh, is a disease that could come without any uh, multiple myeloma or other hematological malignancy so, such as Waldenstrom disease, but it's also a disease that uh, could complicate a multiple myeloma. And sometimes when you are doing the diagnosis of AL amyloidosis, um, you will also find uh, an associated multiple myeloma. So there is a close link between the two diseases. And so we also know that probably if you are searching AL amyloidosis in all patients with a multiple myeloma, the incidence will be much higher than those 15%, uh, uh, about 30%. And uh, probably that um, uh, those 30 percent, a lot of patients have no symptoms and it's just a small component of uh, amyloid fibril, but uh, some of those patients could evolve during their disease uh, with a symptomatic AL amyloidosis complicating, complicating uh, the multiple uh, myeloma disease. So for the AL amyloidosis, the process is the same for the fabrication of the uh, am, uh, uh, amyloid fibril, uh, but it's uh, coming from uh, a plasma cell clone. And so it's very important when you diagnose this, we will see that later, the amyloidosis, to be sure that your amyloidosis is an AL amyloidosis linked to this clone, because uh, if it's another type of amyloidosis, you will not treat the amyloidosis with the same drug that for multiple myeloma. And so the, the, the um, treatment are very different according to the subtype of amyloidosis. And so uh, the um, 
plasma cell clone will produce uh, the antibody, and it will be the light chain of those antibody, mainly uh, the lambda chain, that will be uh, this misfold uh, configuration and then uh, the aggregation of those uh, small protein and give this amyloido amyloid fibrin. But we really know today that uh, the organ dysfunction, yes, it's sure it comes from the deposit of these amyloid fibrils, but it comes also for from a direct toxicity of those abnormal light chain. And so um, it's very uh, important in AL amyloidosis to have this in mind because you have to clear the blood if you want to have an improvement uh, of the symptom of the patient. And this uh, direct tissue toxicity is mainly affecting uh, the, the, heart, the heart, sorry. And so in AL amyloidosis, we will see the incidence, but we will have most frequently uh, heart uh, dysfunction. And then the second uh, most frequently um, organ uh, that will be will have this function is the kidney. But we can have also uh, uh, some uh, bleeding tendency. And this is a picture, classical picture of the patient. You see only that, that if we if uh, in amyloidosis, uh, purpura or uh, bleeding around the eye, the eyes, and you have also. Uh, you could have also an enlargement of uh, the tongue and some nail dystrophy. So um, here you can see the incidence of um, the organ failures or the, uh, um, um, it's not always a failure, but a deposit of uh, uh, amyloid fibril on the organ, and um, the heart is the most frequently, more than 70% will have uh, a deposit of amyloid fibril in the heart. And so it's because uh, the heart is one of the uh, most frequently organ that will be damaged, it's a serious uh, disease and uh, it's very, um, uh, important to uh, diagnose it as early as, as possible because uh, it can lead to life treating uh, organ failure. And so the second um, organ that will be damaged in, the di in this disease is the kidney, but you can see that you can uh, also have a neuropathy, a peripheral neuropathy, such as in the multiple myeloma with the treatment or with the disease, you can have all those symptoms, and also um, gastrointestinal system, uh, liver function could also uh, be um, um, damaged. And so that's typical picture you can see when you have those kind of picture, you are pretty sure that there is a AL amyloidosis. The problem is that when you have those clinical picture, it's probably too late to, uh, to have a good treatment and to have a good prognosis for your patient. So the goal today um, is to improve, of course, the treatment of, op of our patient, but it's to diagnose it earlier. So here uh, you can see the same purpura around the eye, uh, the um, enlargement of uh, the tongue, but also of the shoulder, the patch shoulder symptoms. Is here you have an enlargement of the liver, uh, the salivary gland, you can also have a pulmonary um, dysfunction and infiltrate, and some in local localized amyloidosis, some uh, nodules also. And so what will be the symptoms that the patient uh, will have uh, when there is uh, amyloidosis? Uh, uh, you we, uh, the patient could have what we call dyspnea, so a shortness of the breath, but also swelling of the ankles and the legs, and it's coming, uh, it could come from uh, both renal or cardiac dysfunction. Also, severe fatigue and uh, weakness, and it's difficult be because it's a very common symptom, especially also in patient, multiple myeloma patient, and also the um, peripheral neuropathy with numbness, prickling, tingling, or pain in hands and the feet. Um, sometimes what we call orthostatic hypotension, so it's 
the lowering of blood pressure uh, when uh, there is uh, suddenly uh, standing up. There is also some kind, uh, sometimes digestive uh, symptoms, such as uh, common symptoms also in multiple myeloma patients, chronic uh, nausea, diarrhea, uh, possibly uh, blood diarrhea or constipation. You can also have from this um, accumulation in the digestive system some unintentional significantly weight loss. So we um, saw the pictures of the enlarged uh, tongue. They could also have some skin change. So there is a um, um, tendency of easy bruising and those uh, what uh, I saw uh, you uh, purplish uh, patches around the eyes that it's unique to the amyloidosis. Sometimes with uh, the heart involvement, uh, irregular heartbeat, sometimes difficulty to swallowing, the shoulder pad symptom, and also I show you the picture, the enlargement of salivary glands. So um, some of those symptoms are <coughs> not our common symptoms and could also uh, mimic other more common uh, condition. And it's why uh, it's frequently late diagnosis. And you could imagine that if a patient come to his uh, doctor saying, oh, um, I have some kinds of fatigue, uh, little bit nausea, um, some uh, swelling of the ankle, uh, doctor will not specially uh, think first about uh, the diagnosis of the amyloidosis. And um, there is a um, typical um, pathway of the patient who is um, regularly seeing seven or eight different doctors be uh, before the diagnosis of the amyloidosis. And sometimes the patient are seeing three or four different cardiologists be, uh, before the cardiologist think, oh, uh, this picture could be a typical pi picture of amyloidosis and I have to search uh, this disease. So the information is very important to give this information to the patient, but uh, to uh, the doctor also. And you can also uh, imagine that for a patient with multiple myeloma, if you have those kind of symptoms, uh, this uh, peripheral neuropathy could also come from the monoclonal protein without amyloidosis, could also come from the treatment, uh, bortezomib, velcade, and, and, and so on. And the um, weakness is very frequent, the diarrhea or the constipation, depending on the treatment or the disease. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, painkiller, you have constipation. If you have uh, lenalidomide, you, you have tendency to have uh, diarrhea. And it's sometimes difficult to, to to um, do the, the part uh, to uh, see the symptoms in clink, cling to the multiple myeloma, the, the treatment of the multi myel multiple myeloma, or to this uh, complication. And so this is uh, the message uh, which is given to um, during a, a lot of uh, hematological uh, symposium is that the most important diagnostic uh, step for the amyloidosis uh, is to uh, early and correct diagnosis uh, this uh, disease and also to suspect it earlier that it's uh, no done. And that's a uh, um, sentence from Merlini. And so it always says that early diagnosis of AL is crucial to avoid end organ damage. When the patient has end organ damage, it's very difficult to treat the patient and there is a high risk of uh, mortality due to the disease and due to uh, the treatment. And in that regard, uh, Merlini and all the experts today uh, recommend to uh, Search even in the patient with monoclonal gammopathy of uh, unknown significance, so not the myeloma uh, disease, but the precursor of the myeloma disease. And we know that a lot of elderly patients have this um, abnormal uh, uh, blood protein circulating. Uh, but but um, today we recommend to to check it to 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 see if those patients have no. Um, amyloidosis and by uh, 
uh, measuring some uh, cardiac tests, what we call NC pro BNP, um, and um, the cardiac marker and the proteinuri in um, the urine. If you have in the urine proteinuri, and it's a mainly the monoclonal protein, it's not an amyloidosis. But if it's a mainly albumin, you have to suspect it. And so when you suspect, then you have to diagnose this. And for the diagnosis of uh, amyloidosis, you need a tissue uh, biopsy. You have uh, then to investigate the presence of paraproteinemia, if it's uh, not in the case of uh, a multiple myeloma, of uh, a patient with uh, a multiple myeloma. Then you have to assess the organ involvement, and you have also to exclude that your patient have not uh, uh, symptomatic uh, multiple myeloma. And so one question is uh, which organ you have to uh, biopsy to have the diagnosis. So it's difficult. The, the gold standard will be to, to biopsy the involved organ. That's the best way, but it's not easy to uh, perform a biopsy of the heart, of, of the kidney. There is a risk of bleeding. We know that AL amyloidosis patient have more frequent bleeding. Uh, and so there is a risk uh, if you are uh, doing those biopsies. But we know that when you have amyloidosis, <coughs> sorry, AL amyloidosis or other uh, amyloidosis, there is also an accumulation uh, of those fibril in the um, uh, fat tissue. And so uh, usually we are performing uh, a fat abdominal uh, biopsy, and uh, as we want to exclude also uh, uh, an association with the multiple myeloma, we will also search it on the bone marrow uh, biopsy. And so this is the way uh, we perform the uh, fat tissue biopsy. So it's a it's uh, very easy to perform. Uh, you don't need you need only a local anesthesia. And so if you perform the abdomen, uh, abdomen um, fat biopsy and the bone marrow biopsy, you, hel you, hel you will have the diagnosis in about 90% of the patient. If you still uh, have a high suspicion of amyloidosis, but still not your diagnosis on those uh, biopsy, then um, we will uh, perform a biopsy of the salivary gland or rectal biopsy, and then only um, a biopsy of uh, the um, cardiac or kidney according to the organ uh, involvement on the gastrointestinal uh, tube, that's more easy. On the biopsy, we are uh, to say that you have a biop uh, uh, AL amyloidosis. We are using um, the Congo uh, red. It's a specific um, coloration. And uh, when you are uh, making the coloration of the biopsy with the Congo red, you will uh, have these specific um, pictures. So um, after the um, coloration with Congo red, we are looking at those biopsy with a special light, polarized light, and there will be uh, this uh, specific, uh, what we call birefringence, very Congo red uh, uh, picture uh, for uh, AL amyloidosis. But then you have uh, positivity of Congo red, you know that you have an amyloidosis, but which type of amyloidosis? And that it's an important and not easy part of the diagnosis. You have to type in the amyloidosis. And so um, we have some technique, what we call immunohistochemistry. It's antibody that will uh, recognize uh, the lambda or the kappa uh, light chain or the uh, AA in the inflammation, but it's not always specific. And uh, so you will miss about 30% of the case. Then you have more um, specific uh, tools such as uh, immunoelectron microscopy, but it's highly specific, but there is really uh, limited av availability. 
and the new gold uh, standard for the diagnosis for the typing of the amyloidosis is what we call mass spectrometry of amyloid deposit, and we obtain that uh, by laser, laser uh, capture. So uh, first, we are doing uh, fat, uh, abdominal fat uh, aspiration or biopsy, then uh, you are uh, doing your red Congo uh, coloration, and then the part uh, who is positive uh, for the Congo, uh, the red Congo coloration, you will uh, perform a micro dissection with uh, a laser. And after this micro dissection, there will be a digestion of those proteins by uh, some enzyme. And then we will uh, analyze with uh, um, uh, a, a specific uh, machine, what we call a spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry, um, and a computer algorithm, uh, the analyse of the protein, and the computer uh, will uh, compare those uh, proteins to a refer reference database. And don't so you have here the Congo red uh, without uh, the polarised light. You can see already some uh, abnormal deposit here, so you have the suspicion, and then you have the birefringence with uh, the Congo red. Uh, you can see that if you e use here the antibody against uh, anti-kappa, there is no um, significant um, uh, link to this antibody, no anti-transteritin. There is uh, some calculation with uh, the kappa uh, light chains, and then there will be the dig digestion of those proteins and then analyze with the computer, and then with this, you are pretty sure that you have the good diagnosis. And why is it so important? Because um, some people can could say, okay, we have uh, the red Congo positivity and we have a monoclonal protein in the blood. So we are pretty sure we have an AL amyloidosis. But no, we are not uh, pretty sure because uh, as I told you before, AL amyloidosis is um, Median age of diagnosis is about uh, 65 years old, but it's the same for uh, gamopath monoclonal gammopathy, so those small monoclonal protein without uh, clinical significance and not associated with a multiple myeloma. So you could have a patient with both, and there is no link between the amyloidosis and uh, the monoclonal uh, protein. And so there is a lot of publication, uh, a lot, some publication uh, demonstrating that you could uh, misdiagnose um, hereditary amyloidosis and think that it's AL primary amyloidosis. And this uh, study about more than four, um, 300 patients um, analyze um, the subtype of uh, uh, amyloidosis, and all those patients were diagnosed as light chain AL amyloidosis, and about 10% of the patient, it was a uh, misdiagnosis. It was uh, an hereditary and another type of amyloidosis. So it's very important, this uh, step in the diagnosis, and uh, because, as I told, um, NGUS, so monoclonal uh, protein of uh, immunosignificance is common over 65 years, and uh, the uh, stenyl amyloidosis or the transferritin amyloidosis linked to some uh, mutation uh, also, and there is um, other publication about the same subject. So it's not rare uh, that uh, some hematologists, some doctor or cardiologists could um, give not the good uh, diagnosis. And as I told you, it's very important because if you have a senile of a transteritin amyloidosis, there is no need to give treatment um, for um, that will um, target the monoclonal plasma cells because there is not link uh, between the, the both. And so you will give uh, treatment with potential side effect and with no activity on the uh, amyloidosis it's if it's not an AL amyloidosis. And so sometimes you do not have um, easy access to these new gold standards uh, with uh, micro dissection, laser micro dissection and analyze, analysis 
uh, with um, the spectrum uh, mass. And uh, you could also, if you, and we did it uh, in some patients, if you have an hesitation with AL amyloidosis, you are sure because you have your immunohistochemy um, negative uh, for chronic inflammation, that it's not that. And you are hesitating between um, transteritin senile amyloidosis or other transteritin amyloidosis and AL amyloidosis. But uh, by performing a simple bone scintigraphy, so it's um, first it was not uh, developed for those, but more for uh, searching metastasis for prostate cancer or other bone an anomaly. And um, incidentally, some years ago, we discovered that transteritin uh, link uh, this uh, technetium uh, 919 that we'll use for bone scintigraphy. So if you have an, an hesitation, you could um, perform this exam. It's um, <coughs> easy to uh, do it and uh, you have an access uh, in every hospital to this exam. And if there is AL amyloidosis, there will not, no captation, art captation of the uh, technetium. But if you have uh, transteritin senile amyloidosis, you uh, will have a uh, captation, and sometimes it's uh, also an easy way to um, help the physician in the diagnosis. So, um, to summarize, confirm the presence of amyloid for the diagnosis. Uh, it's a uh, required step. You need it with uh, your red Congo. Uh, you have to confirm the subtype, uh, the subtype of amyloidosis, and this requires considerable expertise. It's why there is a reference center for the amyloidosis. It's complicated to, to diagnosis, to suspect, to diagnosis, and to give the good uh, diagnosis. And then uh, you will also need to exclude and to make all the uh, different exam we are performing uh, for the multiple myeloma patient uh, to exclude uh, the presence of a multiple myeloma. And we have, al you have, we have also to know that um, for AL amyloidosis, we will have uh, a lot of patients who have no monoclonal circulating um, protein in the blood. So, um, AL amyloidosis, a uh, lot of patients will, will have a small clone of uh, circulating monoclonal protein. And it's why we have to search it also uh, in the gammopathy monoclonal of uh, uh, indeterminate uh, significance. And so if we have no monoclonal uh, protein, uh, circulating protein in the blood, um, it's not possible to say there is no AL uh, amyloidosis. You have to first uh, make a more uh, performant exam in the blood, such as uh, the dosage of the light chains, but even the light chains could be uh, negative in the blood, and you, you have to perform uh, the analysis on the serum, but also uh, on the urine, the electrophoresis, but also the immunofixation, and the dosage of the light chains. And if you were uh, performing all those exams, plus the bone marrow evaluation, uh, you will find new monoclonal protein. But we do not have to stop uh, the process because there is no circulating uh, monoclonal protein. And so um, for the patient, we will have uh, the evaluation of the plasma cell clone, so the urine, the serum, the light chain dosage, the bo uh, dosage, the bone marrow evaluation, and it's very important as for the multiple myeloma to perform the cytogenetic uh, evaluation because in those clones, we will have some abnormal translocation uh, in the gene and uh, the response to the, those, um, to the treatment depend of those cytogenetics such as in the mil uh, multiple myeloma. So we will perform also uh, bone evaluation uh, to be sure that there is uh, no uh, bone lesion due to the myeloma, such the anemia. <coughs> and uh, what will be an important step is uh, to search uh, the cardiac involvement. And for the uh, cardiac involvement, we are doing 
to a, a biological marker, uh, the troponin and the anti-proBNP. And those markers are very important. They are mostly always increase in the diagnostic diagnosis of AL amyloidosis with heart involvement. And uh, we will see it's also a prognosis factor. We will, of course, make an echography of the heart and an electrocardiogram. We will analyze uh, the function of the kidney in the blood and in the urine, uh, the liver function, the coagulation test, the, the, the tendency to have some uh, bleeding is due to abnormal coagulation test. We will make a clinical assessment searching for uh, peripheral neuropathy and uh, most frequently we are also uh, doing an MRI of the heart, uh, some alter, so to uh, you are uh, during 24 hour, um, we are analyzing the rate of the heart to be sure that there is no uh, abnormal heart beating, it's very frequent in this uh, disease. Uh, sometimes uh, if there is uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, but we will perform endoscopy plus biopsy and according to the other symptoms, respiratory function test, a scanner of the, 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 ch the chest. Yes? Yes, uh, cytogenetic. So uh, we will uh, perform on the on the bone marrow evaluation, on the, the, the plasma cells, we will research some um, abnormalities in the chromosome of the, those cells. And uh, there is a different way to uh, search those uh, abnormalities. And we are using mainly what we called a uh, fish technique. So you have some uh, probes that will recognize uh, some abnormality. And uh, in multiple myeloma, we know that we have a deletion 70p, we uh, which is giving um, bad prognosis and translocation 414, uh, one Q abnormalities. And in amyloidosis, in those chromosomes, we will mainly search the translocation between the chromosome 11 and 14, uh, because we know that um, those patients are not so well responding to bortezomib velcade and also uh, the 1Q um, uh, abnormality. So, um, you know, we have uh, 46 genes on the uh, 1Q, uh, we, we can, uh, so they, they um, on the, the chromosome 1, you can have some um, mutation on the, uh, on the, part what we call Q or P, and we will most frequently find some uh, abnormality on the 1Q chromosome in the amyloidosis or those translocation. So you have um, two uh, chromosomes and there will be one small part of one chromosome will uh, go to the other uh, chromosome and some kind of there is translocation of some uh, small part of the two between two chromosomes, and that gives us information about the prognosis of the patient, but also the way the patient will answer to different uh, treatment, and it could help for the treatment of the patient. I don't know if if it's more clear. And so uh, we have also to uh, give a prognosis uh, of the patient, and it's really the cardiac involvement that give the most important uh, information, and also those uh, cytogenetic uh, information. Um, if we found more than 10% plasma cell in the bone marrow, uh, so we have to face a multiple myeloma patient, even if there is no, sometimes we have 11% uh, of plasma cells, but no bone uh, lesion, no anemia, no anemia, no kidney dysfunction, but it's a kind of asymptomatic multiple myeloma with AL amyloidosis. And we know that it's better to have less than 10% in the bone marrow for the prognosis. And we are also looking the difference between the dosage of the kappa and the, light, uh, the lambda chain. And if there is a big difference between uh, those uh, dosage, it's uh, a patient is have a less good uh, prognosis. 
Uh, we will also uh, take a look to the number of organ uh, which are involved, to the systolic blood pressure. If the patient have a low systolic blood pressure, it's not a good prognosis because it's reflecting that uh, probably there is um, an autonomic neuropathy and if the patient uh, is doing a complication, infection complication with an heart involvement, um, uh, also a nervous system involvement, there is um, less uh, answer uh, to the inspection and the patient uh, will have uh, some difficulty to maintain a good systolic uh, pressure and uh, there is a high uh, uh, risk of death, of death due to these, uh, those complications. Performance status, how healthy is your patient? If he's uh, always um, in the bed or, he's, uh, um, or the patient is still active, uh, uh, it's important to know it and it will be um, also a prognostic factor and the presence of those, uh, this neuropathy. So uh, what you could see, see uh, here, it's um, what we call the Mayo Clinic um, stage and the Mayo Clinic stage uh, is based on the dosage of those uh, cardiac, <laughs> sorry, cardiac markers, so the anti-proBNP, so we are doing that um, uh, routinely in blood tests or troponin. And if you have uh, some uh, level of, uh, uh, according to the level of those um, two uh, cardiac markers, uh, we can say that the patient is, will have a better or a worse uh, survival and a worse uh, prognosis. And for the patient with the monoclonal, uh, the gammopathy of uh, monoclonal protein, gammopathy of um, immunosignificance or patient with multiple myeloma to detect this uh, complication, we can perform this simple test of dosage in the blood, the anti-promedment P. And if, if it's above um, this um, dosage, you have to suspect and to ask, maybe it could be because you have also an increasing of those dosage with uh, uh, alteration of the kidney function or with the age, maybe there is nothing to do with amyloidosis. But if it's increased, you have to refer your patient to the cardiologist, to a, a cardiologist, um, an expert cardiologist, and ask, uh, exclude uh, secondary amyloidosis. And those, this is um, a new Mayo classification, always based on the, those two uh, cardiac markers, but also based on the difference uh, between the two light chains, the kappa and the lambda uh, light chains. And you can see that we can separate the patient um, with the, those prognoses, uh, with, with those uh, simple biological marker, uh, we can give uh, uh, the prognosis of the patient. And you can see that the patient with advanced disease, we are losing uh, rapidly a lot of patient uh, uh, with advanced disease. And you can see that if you are uh, diagnosing those patients those patient earlier in the disease, the prognosis is really better. And it's why we are <laughs> fighting to have uh, earlier diagnosis for those patients. Here it's very difficult. Patients have uh, usually heart dysfunction. You are begin treatment. There is complication, infection, heart complication, and those patients are rapidly dying, uh, more than 50% of those patients because of the disease and because of the complication of the disease and sometimes because of the treatment. So the number of organ is also important for the diagnosis. Um, and so um, we will treat uh, the patient according to this risk. So we will uh, perform the Mayo Clinic system. We will give the stage of the disease and also, of course, uh, according to the age and the performance status of our patient. And the aim of the treatment is to obtain a rapid and profound decrease of the light chain level. level. If you are not uh, cleaning the blood, because this, this light chain is toxic for the heart, uh, you will have no organ response. And the goal is to have an organ response to amyloid, the, the, the cardiac, the kidney function, or the liver function. 
And so um, it's very important to have a rapid uh, response. Uh, and so um, also, if you want to uh, take out of uh, the amyloid fibril from the organ, uh, you need to have at least a complete uh, or a very good partial response, so decrease of 90% of the monoclonal uh, protein, but uh, as in the myeloma, in the amyloidosis, we have some other way to calculate, but it's uh, uh <coughs> mainly the same. Uh, it's so that's indispensable for organ response, and it's what um, the most um, important because uh, the uh, organ involvement um, is uh, responsible of the death of the patient. Um, so uh, we need the very quick answer. We will effectively adapt the treatment uh, to the age, the comorbidity, the extent of the organ involvement. So we know, I don't have the time, I, I saw that I have maybe to be more rapid. We do, uh, we I don't have the time today to, to say it, but uh, there is some treatment for cardiac, um, cardiac treatment for hypertension or other uh, problem, cardiac problem. It's not possible to give, it's toxic to give it to amyloid, pati amyloid patient. So it's very important to see a specialized uh, cardiologist because you, you, you could not give um, beta blocker, you could not give uh, some uh, other uh, treatment. And the supportive case is uh, very important for uh, those uh, patients uh, also. Just to show that um, the prognosis of the patient is really linked to the hematological uh, response. The first steps when you have to, uh, you will decide if you, um, if you will treat the patient, say, is there a place for all patients uh, for uh, high dose of chemotherapy, so high dose uh, melphalan, the same than for uh, multiple myeloma, and autologous stem cell transplantation. There is a lot of debate about that. And why there is a lot of debate? Because the first study that have been performed with autologous stem cell transplantation show that there is a high uh, TRM, so transplant-related mortality. So in some study, uh, we have lose a lot of patients during the transplant, but even during the stem cell collection. So if you want to collect stem cell for transplantation, you need to hospitalize your patient for the stem cell uh, um, collection and to perform, to hospitalize, but also to have a, a cardiac mon uh, monitoring during the stem cell connection and blood pressure monitoring. So it's very, it's, uh, you need a specialized uh, center. And uh, so you can see that in the first uh, study, there was more than 20% of patients dying during the stem cell collection or uh, in the 100th uh, day uh, after the transplantation. So it's too, um, too big uh, to propose it to all patients. But you could also uh, see that the median survival, uh, there is a wide range. Uh, so in some studies, it was only uh, one point uh, eight years and in other more than eight years. And so um, we uh, learn to improve the supportive care, supportive care of those patients, to hospitalize the patient for the stem cell collection. And uh, so with uh, this, we uh, all the centers, there is a different publication showing that there is an improvement of the result and a decrease in of this uh, mortality in the most uh, recent year with um, uh, more uh, supportive uh, care. And so uh, this is one uh, study showing that there is more than 40% per uh, percent of the patient with uh, long-term survival, more than 10 years, if you are selecting in a good way your patient, so younger patient, good uh, performance status, uh, not uh, so bad um, um, kidney function, and also the most important, that is the uh, classification for the uh, art involvement, uh, not uh, um, an important art uh, disease. And so uh, today uh, we are performing in Belgium, uh, we are um, taking those guidelines, but you can see that <coughs> the last uh, 
IMW Congress merely send the same, and there is a lot of publication saying the, the same. So there is only a small proportion of the patient who will be a candidate for the transplantation, about 50% of the patient, because you, you need some uh, younger patient without a uh, high level of cardiac uh, markers, without uh, important cardiac dysfunction, without important uh, kidney dysfunction, with a good performance status, and we will perform the autologous stem cell transplantation as in the multiple myeloma with the melphalan uh, high dose. But if uh, what's different from the multiple myeloma is that if you have no um, no more than 10% of plasma cell in the bone marrow, you don't need an induction. You can directly go to the stem cell collection and the stem cell uh, uh, transplantation. But if you have more than 10%, then we will use the same drug than in multiple myeloma, cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, two cycles, and then perform the um, autologous stem cell transplantation. And if after the uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, the patient is not in complete remission, we will give as in the multiple myeloma consolidation. That's the recommendation of the um, French society, and the French society are not so uh, um, routinely uh, giving even in good performance status patient with uh, no heart involvement um, a lot of um, autologous stem cell transplantation. <coughs> so those recommendation uh, is to um, uh, treat your patient according to the Mayo stage. And so if you have a stage uh, one or two, you are uh, giving simply melphalan dexamethasone, and if it's more advanced disease, you are giving velcade bortezomib uh, with uh, uh, cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. And what is important in those recommendations is the same with American recommendation or European re recommendation, is that you have to very quickly um, evaluate uh, the, um, the disease, the, ans the, the response disease, and if for the uh, stage two, three with cardiac involvement, if after one cycle or six weeks, you have not a decrease of 50% of the monoclonal protein, we will never require this uh, for multiple myeloma, then you have to add, uh, uh, to change the treatment, to add bortezomib or uh, change the treatment if the patient is uh, on bortezomib. And you have um, to have at three months uh, at least a uh, very good partial uh, response because we are really searching this quick answer to try to have an organ uh, response. And for the low risk stage one, uh, we are less strict and uh, we are um, requiring at three months the 50% reduction of uh, the difference between the two light chains and at six months a 19% uh, reduction. Is the same in the, um, that's come from the Mayo Clinic for the American guidelines. Uh, what we know, see that if you have a severe, really severe cardiac uh, involvement with this marker at a very high level, anti BNP, more than 8,000, it's very complicated. You don't have the choice. You have to use bortezomib to have a quick answer, but you have to do it uh, with uh, cardiac monitoring because there is a, a risk of, tox of heart toxicity of the treatment and of some sudden death on the treatment. So difficult, difficult to treat uh, the patient with uh, advanced stage. So for the patient who are not candidate uh, for um, autologous stem cell transplantation, we will use oral melphalan dexamethasone and for the stage two, three, as uh, the French guidelines and the American guidelines and the European guidelines, Velcad, cyclophosphamide dexamethasone. We will do a risk adapt bortezomib. So if the patient uh, have some kind of neuropathy, we will give it a weekly or if the patient is older, of its uh, low uh, blood pressure, we will uh, monitor the patient if there is a severe cardiac dysfunction. And as I told it before, with uh, some specific um, chromosome abnormality, uh, we know that uh, bortezomib um, has not such uh, uh, good results. So we will use melphalan dexamethasone, or if we want 
to use bortezomib, uh, you need to use a uh, melphalan with bortezomib and not only doing bortezomib with uh, dexamethasone. Um, we know also that um, sometimes, uh, especially here it's an example for the uh, kidney um, function, you perform the transplantation, you have uh, at three months the hematological, uh, complete hematological response, and you have to, you will uh, see a slow amelioration of the uh, renal function measuring by the uh, urine protein and the serum albumin. And you can see that the complete re organ response is for this patient uh, only at three years after the diagnosis. So it will take time to, to have a good uh, uh, organ response. So just to, uh, sometimes there's nothing um, to do with uh, the systemic AL amyloidosis, but you can have some localized amyloidosis. And they will be deposited only at the site of light chain production. It's rare and, and it's more rare than uh, systemic uh, AL amyloidosis. And usually there is only local recurrence. So those patients have very good uh, uh, prognosis and you, you, can, you could find it in uh, tracheal bronchial trees or pulmonary gastrointestinal skin, but it's different. It's the same, um, the same way to develop those nodules, but it will uh, stay localized <laughs> and you will need <laughs> only uh, a resection with uh, laser therapy or sometimes radiotherapy. And so I think that I use all the time a uh, little bit more uh, that I have, but oh, we will improve the, just to say that now we are using chemotherapy or um, not chemotherapy, but um, uh, new drugs, but cycling uh, plasma cell. But in the future, we will uh, use a new um, treatment uh, was, uh, which are targeting uh, the uh, fibril uh, component of amyloidosis or the small other component of the, those fibril uh, deposit uh, the glycoprotein. Uh, we can try to um, make a destructuration of those, um, those amyloid uh, fibril. And so there is interesting data showing that if you are adding doxycycline, so it's an old antibiotic, um, to the treatment of your patient, it will interfere with amyloid fibril formation. Uh, we have first um, data from uh, most model, but now we have also clinical data and uh, we are using um, frequently this association. A uh, new treatment for uh, multiple myeloma are also uh, arriving, such as uh, daratumumab. Uh, daratumumab has very, very uh, promising results. It's not a toxic treatment, and it's very effective also as in the multiple myeloma patient in uh, AL amyloidosis. There is also uh, ongoing um, data uh, on the polyphenol, um, which are in the green tea. And there is a preliminary uh, data showing that if you are giving green tea, uh, extract of green tea um, to uh, amyloidosis uh, patient, there will be, um, you could have some uh, cardiac answer and there is control trial ongoing. Um, and there is a lot, I have a masked slide if you want, but I think that I have no, no time, no uh, new antibody um, targeting um, the different components of uh, the amyloid fibril who are very, very promising. And we, ha we have a lot of hope in those new treatment, but it will be only uh, the phase three will only start or are uh, just uh, starting now, and so it's um, not uh, before uh, some years that we will have an access to those new drugs, but it's very exciting and very uh, promising. And so, of course, we think that we are now um, better before treatment and, if, and with the way to administer the treatment, uh, and uh, especially for the autologous stem cell transplantation. So we can see that there is an improvement uh, of the survival of the patient, but you can see that we are always losing 
during the first months a lot of patients. And so this is due, due because uh, uh, those patients are diagnosed too late. And so uh, we are waiting all those new drugs, um, but I think that we have to work on this early diagnosis to um, improve the prognosis of our patient. So I hope that it's a little bit complicated disease, a little bit complicated um, treatment and so on, but uh, hope that it was clear. I think that the first step will to think about amido amyloidosis. And when you have patients with MGUS or with multiple myeloma, to ask for the symptoms. And even if you have not those symptoms, but you have an increase in a patient MGUS, so that's the patient with a monoclonal uh, a protein without uh, clinical significance. Um, if there is an abnormal uh, light chain ratio, you have just to perform the anti-proBNP dosage. And if it's above 300, uh, um, you have to um, refer to patient uh, to cardiac assessment to search the albuminary. It's an easy way, but if you are performing this to all your MGUS patient and also to uh, your multiple myeloma patient, probably you will uh, have more diagnosis. And I think that we have also to give the, this information to um, other doctors than um, hematological uh, doctor, and we have to uh, give this information also to cardiologists, but a lot of cardiologists um, do not know very well uh, this disease and how to diagnose this. Um, that's the first step. The first important step is to, to think about it. And when the patient with MGUS or if order com is coming with, oh, I'm tired, I'm losing a little bit uh, weight, um, some chronic nausea, just, okay, we will search it and uh, try to, to, to find it. Then I think that uh, we do not have the spectrometry, uh, spectro uh, spectrometry mass, but we are sending it in France. So uh, there is a um, um, possibility to work with uh, other uh, specialized center uh, because I think that it's not available in all the country. Um, and I think also that with the immunochemistry, you can always um, exclude AA. With the kappa lambda, it's sometimes difficult because there is um, sometimes we have uh, captation, so you have uh, positivity. <laughs> For both uh, kappa lambda, it's difficult to to to, to see it, and um, I think that a good anamnesis is to be sure that there is no a story in the family, there is no a story of cardiac dysfunction, and such. Is, is if there is uh, this story, to search uh, mutation uh, and hereditary uh, amyloidosis. And then if you are at the end of the day uh, hesitating between AL or senile or transteritin amyloidosis, the, the scan, the bone scan uh, scintigraphy, it's a good way to, to, to help you. But I think that uh, you have to work with, to try to involve some cardiologists in your pathway of the disease and, um, and to, yes, to, to, to search it with simple biological marker, albuminary, and, and anti-proBNP, and then to... Um,
important to call my yellow now. Oh, thank you. And we also know that for AL amyloidosis, the treatment is adapted. You talk about risk adapted chemotherapy. It's not the same dosage for AL than for myeloma. So how do you treat patients who has concomitantly multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis? Um, we treat, um, it, it depends. If we have just 11% um, of uh, plasma cells and no crap symptom or new um, or new um, myeloma marker um, for aggressivity, uh, we will treat the patient just as amyloidosis, but if we want to perform a transplantation, we will make before, we'll do before uh, an induction with two cycles or four cycles or, or uh, bortezomib cycle for some dexamethasone. But it's, it's a multiple myeloma, symptomatic multiple myeloma, with uh, AL amyloidosis, um, we will treat the patient uh, according to the multi <coughs> sorry, it's the allergy. <laughs> yes, but it's um, time for allergy uh, and so on. So we will treat the patient according of um, or multiple myeloma guidelines, but and so sometimes we will have access to different drugs, uh, and it's better for those uh, patients, uh, especially um, in the context of the relapse of not uh, or, or we are not happy with the answer. We will have access to the daratumumab, uh, and so that's. Uh, uh easier for, for us to have access to the new drugs. But at the time of diagnosis, so we, if the patient is a candidate for the transplantation, uh, we will treat the patient um, as for the multiple myeloma, as we are using uh, the same uh, drug, but we will um, perform uh, more tests, cardiac tests, uh, we will uh, have less patient candidate for the stem cell transplantation. So we will also, we will uh, follow a mix of the myeloma and the amyloidose guidelines. We will use the drug of the myeloma, but uh, we will use the criteria for stem cell transplantation of the IL amyloidosis. The only thing that could change is the fact that if we have a translocation 1114, uh, we would like to add uh, melphalan in the induction treatment because we know that the patient <coughs> will not have a good answer to the, the bortezomib. Um, and for the patient uh, with who are not candidates for transplantation, um, in Belgium we have the gold standard, the first line uh, is uh, MVV, melphalan, prednisone, uh, velcade, or lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and we will prefer um, uh, melphalan um, with uh, velcade, uh, as in first line we have not a lot of uh, data uh, with uh, lenalidomide, and we know that uh, we have a more rapid answer with uh, proteasome inhibitor, um, and so unless the patient have really severe cardiac function, severe neuropathy, we will use lenalidomide. You spoke a little about uh, losing patients even before the stem, stem cell transplant. Yes. And in the 100 days after. Is it just uh, um, the heart involvement or um, what was that, that exactly? That it's mainly, so many, patients? Many, mainly patient with heart involvement. And so yes. the improvement is due to measuring the NT pro BNP? Uh, Probin P is a marker of the cardiac involvement, mm -hmm. and so um, we improve patients with severe cardiac dysfunction during the first months. We are not, we have not a so impressive improvement of the prognosis of the patient, but um, as um, I show it. Um, 
for the patient candidate who are candidate for the stem cell transplantation, we are not selecting a patient with uh, severe heart dysfunction. And uh, I think that in the first uh, study with stem cell transplantation, we were less strict, and so some patients had severe cardiac dysfunction and have um, an autologous stem cell transplantation. And we know that today it's not a pos it's not um, there is no way for those kind of treatment for those patients. It's too too uh, EV uh, treatment. But we also, uh, for those patients, uh, make the amelioration of the prognosis because of the monitoring of those patients and the collection of those patients. And also, after the stem cell transplantation, we know those patients are more f have more frequently bleeding. And we know that for multiple myeloma patients, after the stem cell transplantation, during the aplastic phase uh, with the low plaquette number, we will um, give transfusion when the patient have less than 10,000 uh, platelets in the blood. But for AL amyloidose, we will be more strict. We will uh, search blood in the in the in the two uh, NV the stools, and we will also uh, make the transfusion uh, at uh, 20,000 um, level. And so it's all those kinds of things that improve the the pronostic of the stem cell transplantation, but also the fact that we are better uh, selecting more patient. to confirm the diagnosis for mass spectrophotometry? Uh, so we, we are first performing uh, the immunochemistry. Um, <coughs> we are doing also uh, sometimes um, electronic uh, microscopy. Um, and then when we have the wet Congo, we have, if you have the, we are sure, sometimes we are sure of the diagnosis with immunochemistry. You have only positivity for lambda or kappa chain, and not this, um, um, this difficulty to, 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 to see that you could uh, experience. And so we are not referring the samples to other center in this case. And um, sometimes it's very difficult. The pathologist could on only say, uh, okay, it's not an AA amyloidosis, it's only what I can say. And those kinds, sometimes you are performing, uh, we are always performing a bone CT, but even if we see that there is a transteritin, um, sometimes difficult to, to say which one uh, you have to, to search the mutation. And then uh, for those cases, we are um, sending our, um, our samples. I think that we have to, it's a rare disease. Uh, at this time in Belgium, there is no, um, this tool to analyze. And, and we have, for rare disease, we have to, to work between experts to be sure of the diagnosis. And uh, so we are, even for the multiple myeloma, we are, mm, we are also, but not for, we are not sem uh, sending uh, samples, but we are working with the IFM group with the, so it's always important to have collaboration and to work together, uh, especially for those rare disease. So we do not hesitate to contact uh, them and to send uh, the samples. And they're always happy with that. So there is a... Thank you.